So now we go on uh, with Samantha Cairns, and I forgot your name. <laughs> She's not on the program, but she was supposed to speak too, so they're going to um, divide their 20 minutes uh, in two. So I give you the word. Right, I'm going to endeavour to keep to my 10 minutes with a timer on my clock, which will make a noise so you'll know if I've failed to do it. Um, my name's Sam Cairns, and I work at the Museums, Libraries and Archives Council, which is the UK government agency, sorry, English government agency for museums. And I wanted to come and talk to you about a project that we've been running since 2009, because I think there are lessons that we've learned which might be transferable and useful. I actually also feel, I should say, as Everything I've been hearing today and previously in the conference, I feel like I'm going to repeat a lot of things. So, but, you know, education is repetition sometimes. So hopefully there's some things which are useful for you in here. I'm going to speak for 10 minutes about the overarching program, and then I'm going to hand over to Miranda Stern from Orleans House Gallery, who's one of our partners, who's going to talk about their specific experiences. So the Challenging History program it's, it's about history that's contested or difficult to understand, distressing to know about. Um, and what we found in the UK is that lots of museums are very risk averse. They don't want to do histories that they think are going to perhaps upset some of their stakeholders, upset their funders. But also they feel that they have a real duty to look at difficult histories, the things that really make our societies rich and engaging. And, and so we wanted to look at how, as education people, we could help our organizations do this more and actually lead some of that work. It started in 2009. Um, there are four lead partners of Challenging History. So my organization, Historic Royal Palaces, which includes the Tower of London, Imperial War Museum, and City University. And we also have a Gruntvig partnership, which includes some EU partners, so the Ditsen Memorial in the Czech Republic. And that's the Forum for Contemporary History in Germany. Um, we and Orleans House is one of the partners in the EU project as well. The role of the program is we don't look at any specific types of history. We're interested in the skills that we need, what is best practice, what is transferable. So we, we're a network, we work together, we ask each other questions informally and at events. We support each other and we also look at research, which I appreciate are all things that everyone else has been saying today as well about what they do. So it's all about us doing similar things. We have a conference coming up in February in London, which you're all invited to. Um, it's 23rd to the 25th. If you are an EU member state or um, work, in, work in one of the organizations that's joining the EU, um, you can get funding from Gruntvig. We're on the catalog. And if you want to know more about that, um, ask me afterwards. The other thing I should add, which means I'm already overrunning on my time here, is um, I think the Seeker tool is very interesting for the people who are part of our network. And we're going to look at some of the work people are doing in our museums and see how it fits into the Seeker tool and look at that at the conference in February. So it, again, that could be interesting. And we will obviously put information about that on various websites. So what is challenging history? Um, I put this picture up because I think this visually represents what challenging history is about. I probably need to explain it. It's a, it's a photograph that was created by Alex Drago, who is the member from Historic Royal Palaces, who's also a photographer. And it's, you can't see it probably, it's, it's a picture of the memorial at Sachsenhausen concentration camp just outside Berlin. Um, it's interesting because the camp was used by the Nazis and then the Soviets used it after the end of the Second World War. Um, the memorial itself is just to the communist prisoners who died there and were incarcerated there. It's not to everyone. So there's lots of difficult bits about this history, about how people understand it, what, what their conclusions are about it. And what Alex has done is he's gone on Flickr, so the photo sharing of software online, and he's looked at all the different pictures people have put up of the memorial on Flickr, and he's put them all together into one piece. And, it shows that thing about history is lots of different stories. There is no one story, there's no one right answer. And it's impossible to actually um, show a picture of, you know, this is the history, this is how it was, that's clear. History is always murky, and our challenging history is an attempt to, um, to look more at that and, um, and think about the ways in which, as museum educators, we help people to unpick those histories, learn from them, and decide how that impacts on what they want, how they want to live their lives today. 
So just as a, a, a definition as well, um, we were saying contested, sorry, challenging history is any history that's contested where people don't agree about what happened. Slavery, uh, for example, is a contested history in the UK. Um, I think everyone agrees it's a crime against humanity, it was a horrendous thing, but who is responsible? The effects today are things that are contested. And it's also any history that's distressing to know about, that it's actually upsetting to, to know more about it. And they're the things that we look at in the network. Some questions which I thought might be interesting for you to consider in your own work and in your own practice that we keep coming across, and we have some answers, but not all of them, about is um, what is our role when we interpret difficult or challenging histories? Because sometimes there's an aspect of memorialization, of commemoration, and that sometimes is, is very different to actually helping people understand the history. So you might want to think about the different roles of people, the, the, the bystander, the victim, the perpetrator within history, but memorialization is normally about the victims and you're not making judgments there for yourself. So, so how do those, what is our role when we do history? What is our responsibility to the history and to the audiences? If it's something that's very distressing and upsetting to know about, to what extent is it your responsibility to get the history out there about what happened to victims? But to what extent is the, you know, the group of children in front of you your responsibility to them, to not distress them, upset them? And how do you manage that? And then the final question is actually about quality. How do we do this the best way we can? Because if you're dealing with history which is so strong and so loaded and so important to lots of different people and communities, the capacity to get it wrong almost seems so much worse, like an injustice to the victims, but also to the communities today. So a lot of our questions are around best practice, so the Seeker tool is gonna to be very useful there. Some thoughts that we had specifically around delivering quality about individually what we can do, because we are all powerful actors in our world. We can do things, make change. Also, what as organizations we can do? And then I'm just going to run through a list of um, a checklist that we came up with working across our network of what you can think about um, to, if you're going to do a difficult history, a sort of list of seven things to think about that should mean that you've looked at every area that you need to. I'm just going to read that list out. So if you want to have it explained, you should start writing down the web address at the bottom of the screen, and you can download the report which includes these seven things and explains them um, from our website. So, but just in terms of quality and in individuals, I think things that we've learned is it's very important to see yourself as having a practice in the way that artists have practice. And we talked about best practice already, but actually individually saying, there's something unique I bring to this, these are my skills. I'm going to commit to developing them over time. I'm going to seek out the training I need to develop my particularly unique skills. I'm going to get the mentoring, I'm going to ask peers to support me. Um, something else is also a plea to people to, um, I've been doing another project for an organization called the Cultural Learning Alliance about the evidence base for cultural learning. And it feels like for the last however many years, everyone in, in England has been saying, there's no evidence of the impact of you know, working with museums. You can't prove attainment in schools, which is what people want. And actually, my conclusion is there is evidence out there. It's just we don't spend enough time seeking it out, trying to find it, and looking transnationally and all sorts of things. So I think individually you need to make a commitment to going out there and researching the best practice, but also putting your own information out there, the evaluation that you've done, which again we already talked about in the first session. So sharing things as well. And the final thing about quality with difficult histories is the authenticity of your approach. You really have to be expert in the history that you are delivering because a community we've found feels cheated if they feel that you, haven't, you don't know the history inside out, that you can't be the expert there. So that's incredibly important. And then at an organizational level, um, something which I think is a rule of thumb, which I'm sure everyone knows, is to consult with audiences on what they think is important. If you're going to approach a subject which is difficult, ask the audiences what they think is important. Um, this question of authority, uh, which is coming up a lot in the UK, which is around... Um, the authority of the organization, the scholarship, and the authority of the community as people to whom this history is part of their sense of self. And actually, they sometimes feel that the museum takes the authority from them, and we need to think about how we manage sharing authority. We mentioned staff training and support and evaluation of what you do, and that's the Inspiring Learning for All framework. I've only got 45 seconds left. Um, these are the seven issues that we felt it was important to consider. 
um, when looking at difficult histories that we came up with our network of 30 people that we've been working on. I'm going to read them out for the benefit of people who are having translation um, and then hand over straight to Miranda. So the seven issues were ethics, ownership, and responsibility linked to any particular history, the role and positionality of audiences for your work, including their entry narratives, how you will recognize the complexity and multiplicity in the heritage, how you will define learning, meaning-making, and understanding when engaging with the heritage, the role of empathy and personal resonance in any activity, framing space and place of any activity, and the role of memorialization and commemoration in your work. Hello, everybody, and um, good morning. Can you all hear me okay? Fab. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, Sam, for keeping to time. I will endeavor to do likewise. Um, so, as Sam said, my name's Miranda Stern, and I'm from Orleans House Gallery. Um, which you may not have heard of. Orleans House is a relatively small local government run museum and art gallery in southwest London. It's the principal public art gallery of the London borough of Richmond upon Thames. Um, case study seems like a relatively grand term for what I'm about to do. They're more like just little snapshots of a couple of bits of project work we've done. Um, that kind of fall under this theme of challenging histories. I should say we've been formally part of the Challenging Histories program really only for just one year, but like I'm sure many of you, we've been working in this area for rather longer than that. Um, the first case study I want to give you is Parallel Views, which is a project we did back in 2007 to mark the bicentenary of the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and this was part of commemorations that happened all across the UK um, to mark that anniversary, very much policy-driven, encouraged by the government at the time, their Department for Culture, Media and Sport, um, to make sure that this anniversary was marked in museums and heritage organisations across the UK. And I have to say, perhaps initially, maybe the expectation that it was that it would be a celebration of the UK's heroic role in helping to, you know, abolish the slave trade. And what, of course, became evident very quickly was that, that there was something highly inappropriate about that if you did not acknowledge the UK's role in perpetrating the slave trade for the centuries beforehand. Um, so already there's a slightly contested history there. Um, there was lots of work going on across the country, and for us that meant there was a real need to be locally relevant and to ground what we presented within our museum um, in rigorous research and to tie it very closely to our collection and to the local area to avoid the idea that we were just sort of jumping on the bandwagon and addressing this history just because everyone else was at that moment. And so we sort of framed our project around the question, what's the slave trade got to do with us? Um, partly anticipating perhaps what would go through the minds of some of our audiences um, when they saw that we were tackling this topic. So as I said, we, th this involved us going out and looking at our collection, which is mainly an art collection relating to the local area, paintings, prints and drawings of the local landscape and um, material relating to local historic figures, um, and looking in detail at the connections between those places and those people, that local heritage and the global history of slavery and the slave trade and abolition. Um, I should say, you know, we're a leafy green borough in southwest London. We're not a part of the UK where there's lots of very obvious physical heritage. We don't have sugar warehouses, for example. We're not in a Dockland city. Um, so it's about looking at those histories and helping our local audiences understand them. And we not only did that ourselves, but we worked with young people to research and then to present that heritage. So we did projects with schools, for example, where the young people found out about their local links and then made a sort of television documentary style piece on that theme. Um, and we also did some site-specific performance work that allowed us to literally bring the stories that we were researching kind of to life physically 
in our space, in the grounds of our gallery, to make it clear that, yes, this, this is our local heritage as well as a global history. And, of course, we attempted to measure the impact through evaluation. This, however, is highly unscientific. There is a more rigorous report on our website, but this is just one quote from an exhibition visitor. Um, and I, I particularly like the second half of it that says, you know, the Riverside painting showing those who benefited from the slave trade, including Alexander Pope, was especially touching and insightful, very effective research. And I like this quotation because it suggests that people were taking away new knowledge and understanding, if we're talking in inspiring learning for all terms, but that there was also a kind of emotional hit to what we'd presented. And the respondent here, he's referring, he or she, I'm not sure which actually, to this painting. It's a painting that's in our collection. It's by an artist called Peter Tillemans. It's a painting we show a lot, but usually we show it in the context of saying, this is, you know, this is what Richmond was like in the 18th century. It was an elegant place. It was the home of men of letters, of the literati, of poets. Um, and this time we presented it saying, all that is true, but isn't it interesting to note that out of the maybe six buildings you can see in the painting, four of them were owned by people who were economically implicated in the slave trade. Um, I'm going to jump forward to a more recent project now. Um, this was sort of 2009 to now, um, and it's our Stories of the World project. Um, Stories of the World is a program that's run, I believe, across the UK, certainly across England. It's a major project of the London 2012 Cultural Olympiad, and I think I've got that form of words correct. If anyone's worked with Olympic branding, you'll know what I mean. Um, it's a project, that, the Stories of the World projects were supported by MLA Council and Renaissance Money in England. And in London, the projects were about young people exploring the history of London's interaction with the rest of the world through museum objects. Um, and not just exploring those stories, but also acting as interpreters of those stories. Um, and you don't need me to tell you that, once again, the history of London's interaction with the rest of the world certainly has the potential to be a challenging and contested history. We focused our project on a collection relating to a 19th century explorer, Sir Richard Burton. So, not the film star Richard Burton, another one, who was a 19th century explorer, went off looking for the source of the Nile, went undercover on pilgrimage to Mecca and was one of the first European non-Muslims to do so. He's quite an exciting character in an adventure story, Indiana Jones-esque way. It's quite easy to engage young people with him and his story. But what we needed to make sure we were doing was not just sort of pandering to that allure of the exotic and not presenting his views on the places he went and the people he met uncritically. Um, at the same time, we were working with participants for whom kind of packaging the history up in a lot of complex post-colonial thought was not going to do the trick, really, and I don't mean to patronise the participants. We had to find a different way of challenging what we were presenting to them. And the way we attempted to do that it was by, at the same time as introducing them to Burton and the objects he'd brought back and the things he had to say, about places he had encountered on his travels. Um, we also introduced them to contemporary art practice from some of those same places to provide a bit, just to broaden out their perspective, to provide a bit of a challenge. So the example here, the central image is a necklace that Burton brought back from West Africa. It was a gift to him from the King of Dahomey, which is modern-day Benin. It's apparently made out of human bone. I'm ashamed to say we don't know whether that is the case because we've not had it forensically tested yet. Um, it, it speaks of, again, you know, cannibalism, which is what he reported he saw there, those kinds of issues. Um, so that, that wasn't the only image of West Africa we were presenting. We also introduced the young people to some contemporary artists from modern-day Benin, um, the image on the left is by an artist called Gerard Quainham. We also looked at Ramald Hazame and at Julian Singozin. And these are all artists whose work deals with the challenges of modern-day Benin, but also the, the challenging history of West Africa. 
So the young people were encountering both those things and then generating their own creative responses, which is what you see in the third image. Um, and all of this work um, culminated in an exhibition that we held from January to May this year that brought together the historic objects from the Burton collection, the contemporary art practice that the young people had looked at, and then their own creative responses. Um, so that's another way we've looked at trying to tackle some of these challenging histories in the context of working with young people. Um, and I sort of wanted to end again on sort of throwing up that question <laughs> that Sam alluded to relating to authority. Um, we've spoken a lot at this conference there we go, about meaning making and um, consultation and multiple voices and in the UK there's a definite trend towards young people as interpreters um, of objects and of heritage which is in general I think a brilliant thing. In the context of challenging histories it does throw up new challenges when we hand over that control over those kind of nuanced histories um, in relation once again to kind of our responsibilities to the histories and to the wider audiences so that's sort of where I wanted to end um, and should I wrap up um, just to finally replug if you want to know more about our projects obviously get in contact with me go to our website if you want to discuss further challenging histories and best practice around dealing with them um, do have a look at our conference in February thank you